Good day and welcome to the TriNet second quarter 2020 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I'd now like to turn the conference over to Alex Bauer, Investor Relations. Please go. Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Trinet's 2020 second quarter conference call. Joining me today are Burton M. Goldfield, our president and CEO, and Mike Murphy, our chief financial officer. Our prepared remarks were pre-recorded. Burton will begin with an overview of our second quarter operating and financial performance. Mike will then review our financial results in more detail and provide our forward-looking guidance. We will then open up the call for the Q&A session. Before we begin, please note that today's discussion will include our 2020 third quarter and full year guidance and other statements that are not historical in nature, are predictive in nature, or depend upon or refer to future events or conditions, such as our expectations, estimates, predictions, strategies, beliefs, or other statements that might be considered forward-looking. These forward-looking statements are based on management's current expectations and assumptions and are inherently subject to risks, uncertainties, and changes in circumstances that are difficult to predict and that may cause actual results to differ materially from statements being made today or in the future. Except as may be required by law, we do not undertake to update any of these statements in light of new information, future events, or otherwise. We encourage you to review our most recent public filings with the SEC, including our 10-K and 10-Q filings, for a more detailed discussion of the risks, uncertainties, and changes in circumstances that may affect our future results or the market price of our stock. In addition, our discussion today will include non-GAAP financial measures, including our forward-looking guidance for non-GAAP net service revenues, adjusted EBITDA margin, and adjusted net income per share. For reconciliations of our non-GAAP financial measures to our GAAP financial results, please see our earnings release or our 10-Q filing for our second quarter, which is available on our website or through the SEC website. A reconciliation of our non-GAAP forward-looking guidance to the most directly comparable GAAP measures mm -hmm. is also available on our website. With that, I will turn the call over to Burton for his opening remarks. Thank you, Alex. As a result of COVID-19 and the subsequent economic downturn, the second quarter proved to be a complex operating environment. I am pleased with our financial results, which are attributable to our strategy, execution, and the resiliency of our customers. In the second quarter, we grew GAAP total revenues 1% year over year to $948 million. Net service revenues grew 45% year over year to $335 million. Professional service revenues decreased 5% year over year to $121 million. During the second quarter, insurance service revenues increased 2% year over year to $827 million. In the quarter, insurance service revenues outperformed due to better than expected retention and a health plan participation rate exceeding 70%. This is the highest recorded health participation rate we have experienced. It is largely due to a mixed shift in the Trinet customer base. Net insurance service revenues increased 106% year over year to $214 million. The growth in our net insurance service revenues was the result of significantly lower insurance costs. The drivers behind the decline in insurance costs were one time in nature and driven by lower health utilization as a result of the decrease in medical services partially offset by COVID cases. The cost savings in the second quarter were significant 
and we intend to leverage these savings for the benefit of our customers. Our press release on July 16th announcing the return of certain administrative fees to our customers in the form of a fee credit is one example of these savings. Additionally, we are creating a recovery credit program which we expect will have an even larger impact on our customers moving forward. This program will support our incredible customers as we jointly commit to our ongoing relationship. Later in the call, Mike will share additional details regarding this innovative and impactful program that we are announcing here today. Our Q2 GAAP earnings per share grew 192% year over year to $1.87 per share. Q2 adjusted net income per share also grew 190% to $2.03 per share. From a cost perspective, we were able to actively manage our operating expenses during the quarter. This is a direct result of previously described investments in process improvements over the last 18 months. However, we continue to invest in these types of initiatives, including modularity and automation. Additionally, these initiatives resulted in a significant improvement in our second quarter installed base net promoter score polling. We realized a 33% improvement in our NPS score, accelerating a multi-quarter trend. I am very proud of this improvement in customer satisfaction, and I am thankful to our colleagues for their commitment to our customers in this difficult time. We finished the quarter with approximately 313,000 worksite employees, down 3% year over year. Our ending second quarter WSE count exceeded our forecast. In late April, when we reported our first quarter earnings, we provided an intra-quarter WSE count which was between 300 and 305,000 WSCs. In hindsight, that volume count proved to be our intra-quarter low. In May and June, with states reopening and the positive effects of the Paycheck Protection Program being felt, our installed base stabilized. The rate of customer attrition, layoffs, and furloughs all declined, resulting in the Trinet customer base being comprised of nearly 80% white-collar workers. Incredibly, our customers returned to positive change in existing in June, predominantly in our white-collar verticals. In the quarter, Despite the difficult operating and economic environment, our cash flow remained strong. We spent $60 million repurchasing 1.4 million shares in accordance with our capital management strategy. As previously mentioned, we experienced our highest level of health enrollment rates in Q2 at over 70%. We found that customers who secure their health benefits through Trinet are likely to stay longer with us. Along with health benefits, the challenges our customers face as a result of COVID-19 highlight the importance of our technology and service model. For the last several years, we have been investing in our technology and service model. A result of this investment is our omni-channel service model where we can efficiently service customers how, when, and where they want to be served. Whether it's a high-touch interaction with experts, a call center transaction, or a chat box, we are there to respond to and address our customers' needs 24 hours a day. Additionally, 
our mobile app is highly rated and well utilized. We regularly produce content which addresses various employment, benefits, and government program related issues. Much of our content is posted on our COVID Trinet Business Resiliency and Preparedness Center found on our website. So far, we have posted 11 webinars with over 20,000 attendees. Several webinars targeted the PPP loan process. As an example, to date, we've produced four webinars on just PPP, garnering over 10,000 views. Presently, our PPP-related efforts have pivoted to helping our customers generate the reports necessary to achieve PPP loan forgiveness. Given the critical support provided by this program, we are hopeful the government will continue to support SMBs through the remainder of this pandemic. Trinet's customers are the small and medium-sized businesses that are supporting our country through this crisis. Customers like RE3D. RE3D is a manufacturing startup which provides affordable 3D printers for the global market. The RE3D printer Gigabot is easily transportable, can use recycled plastic, and allows its users to build products where they are needed. RE3D is currently hiring full-time engineering, sales, and manufacturing employees. Over the past several months, in response to COVID-19, RE3D leveraged their internal R&D to design and prototype PPE and other life-saving devices. The company mobilized its global customer base to produce necessary healthcare equipment on-site, filling regional supply gaps while eliminating shipping delays. Working with customers like RE3D is an example of the important role Trinet plays in helping these amazing customers have a positive impact on our world. We understand, however, that many of our customers are still facing significant challenges as they navigate this uncertain and difficult environment. For example, our Main Street vertical has been hit the hardest with layoffs, furloughs, and customer attrition. As we look forward, uncertainty around the economic environment continues. We remain cognizant that the economic recovery may be more drawn out than originally predicted. With respect to new sales, we see continued interest in Trinet's products and services. The sales paradigm has shifted significantly with meetings being held remotely. This has elongated the decision-making process. However, average deal size in the first half has nearly doubled year over year as we pivoted to larger customers. We expect to continue to make new sales through the balance of 2020, although at a significantly lower rate than in previous years. That said, we do expect to leverage our improved customer satisfaction to drive growth through referrals as the economy rebounds. Finally, we continue to pursue inorganic growth where it makes sense. For us, that means exploring opportunities to expand into new geographies or into attractive verticals. As you saw today, we announced the acquisition of Littlebird. Littlebird represents our ability to identify industries where our value proposition is particularly well suited. Through this acquisition, we are expanding our footprint in an attractive area of our nonprofit vertical while adding significant industry expertise. While the financial and volume impacts from this acquisition are limited, we are excited about this deal as it represents 
an expansion into one of our core verticals with a large, attractive market opportunity. The entire Trinet team welcomes Little Bird to our company. With that, I will turn the call over to Mike for the financial review. Mike? Thanks, Burton. As I review the financials, I'm going to focus on the gap and non-gap numbers where appropriate. But first, on our last earnings call, I previewed that our Q2 results and 2020 guidance would be significantly impacted by timing as the result of COVID-19. And this is what has happened and what we expect to happen. And this timing includes the timing of our insurance performance. For the second quarter, we guided to a net insurance margin range of 19 to 23%. And we delivered 26% as cost savings exceeded our forecast. We expect to see a reversal of this in the second half. COVID-19 also impacted our volume of WSCs as we exited the second quarter with higher WSCs than our forecast. And insurance costs due to reduced utilization of health services, partially offset by direct cost of COVID care. And finally, our revenue as we began to accrue for our client recovery credit program. And while I won't separate out the COVID-19 impact on our WSE volume, I will reference how it impacted our revenue results. As Burton referenced, we finished the second quarter with approximately 313 worksite employees, a 3% decline year over year. Average WSE count for the second quarter was approximately 314,000, a year over year decrease of 2%. During the second quarter, GAAP total revenues increased 1% year-over-year to $948 million, and net service revenues grew 45% year-over-year to $335 million. GAAP total revenues were offset by 6%, or $56 million, as a result of our initial accrual for our recovery credit program. Professional service revenues for the second quarter decreased 5% year-over-year to $121 million. And while our professional service revenues in the quarter outperformed our forecast, the year-over-year -year decline was driven by our year-over-year -year decrease in WSC volumes and a 5% accrual for the recovery credit. Insurance service revenues for the second quarter increased 2% year-over-year to $827 million. The growth in insurance service revenues was also offset by the 6% recovery credit accrual. Net insurance service revenues increased 106% year-over-year to $214 million, with a net insurance margin of 26%. The growth in net insurance service revenues was the result of reduced health utilization of all services as a result of shelter-in-place orders, and lower COVID-19 incidents as the shelter-in-place orders were effective in reducing initial positivity rates, combined with COVID-19 costs that were slightly lower per patient and less testing costs. As we have said on prior calls, our pre-COVID expectation for the net insurance margin was about 11 to 12%. So, we estimate that the net favorable impact of COVID-19 on our second quarter insurance costs was approximately $160 million. When we exclude the impact of our recovery credit and our estimate of the favorable impact from COVID-19, we estimate our net service revenue was roughly flat year over year. Our second quarter GAAP effective tax rate was 26% for the quarter. Our non-GAAP tax rate was 25.5%. GAAP net income increased 174% year over year to $126 million, or $1.87 per share, compared to $46 million, or $0.64 cents per share, in the same quarter last year. Adjusted net income increased 172% year-over-year to $136 million, or $2.03 per share, compared to $50 million, or $0.70 cents per share, in the same quarter last year. Adjusted EBITDA for the second quarter increased 134% year-over-year to $199 million, compared to $85 million during the prior year period for an adjusted EBITDA margin of 59%. Adjusted EBITDA benefited from both timing and prudent expense management 
as we carefully managed colleague-related expenses. We closed the quarter with total cash of $637 million. Working capital was $364 million in the second quarter versus $284 million in the first quarter of 2020. Through the six months ended June 30th, 2020, we generated $315 million of positive corporate cash flow from operating activities and used $445 million primarily in settlement of WSE-related payroll tax obligations. As a result, total cash outflow from operations was $130 million. We spent approximately $60 million to repurchase 1.4 million shares of stock in the second quarter in accordance with our capital management approach. We will continue to repurchase stock in the second half at a similar pace to the first half, subject to the price of our stock. Most of the EPS accretion benefit from our second half repurchases will be realized in 2021. Turning now to our 2020 third quarter and full year outlook, I will provide both GAAP and non-GAAP guidance. And in an effort to be transparent given these unprecedented times, I will provide a summary of the changes to our guidance before providing a more comprehensive review. For the year, we are raising our GAAP total revenue guidance due to our higher than originally forecasted WSE count and our higher health participation rate experienced in Q2. We are also raising the top end of our adjusted EBITDA margin range to reflect our full year OPEX expectations. As a result, the top end of our EPS guidance ranges will also be raised. Please recognize that as we referenced previously, there are significant timing differences between the first half and the second half results for 2020. First, the health cost savings that we realized in the second quarter are expected to reverse in the second half as we continue to accrue for the recovery credit and realize incremental COVID-19 insurance related costs that are no longer offset by savings from healthcare utilization. Second, you will see an increase in OPEX in the second half as we invest in growth and IT initiatives. We would characterize this spend as project-based and not permanent spending increases. Our top end of guidance presumes that US policymakers will continue to support employment and SMBs using programs like its Paychecks Protection Program for the balance of 2020. The low end of our guidance now assumes limited or no direct additional support of employment via liquidity funding to SMBs. Our gap revenue guidance is now informed by our volume growth assumptions under these two economic outlooks, as well as our recovery credit accrual. When compared to our outlook last quarter, we have changed the shape of our WSE forecast from a steep decline, followed by a rapid recovery, to a shallow decline, which we realized in the second quarter, to be followed by a much more flat recovery and later in the year. We also believe new sales will continue to be low in the third and fourth quarters, hindered by economic uncertainty and deferred decision making. Overall, we assume the impact from the pandemic will be much more regionalized and fragmented, with some areas returning to business growth, while others returning to various forms of business shutdown. Our gap revenue guidance will also be impacted by our recovery credit accrual. We expect to accrue most of the remainder of our forecasted savings over the second half. Currently, we anticipate this to be about 2 to 4% of gap revenue. Before we go any further, let me talk through the mechanics of the recovery credit. First, the recovery credit will be accrued in financial year 2020 and payable beginning late 2020 through financial year 2021 at the time Trinet and our clients choose to extend our relationship. Second, the accrual is classified on our balance sheet as restricted cash and the changes in cash flow through our WSE related cash. As a result of these assumptions, we now forecast our full year 2020 net insurance margin to be in the range of 12 to 14 percent. And excluding the impact from the recovery credit and COVID-19 costs, we are forecasting our second half net insurance margin to be in the range of 10 to 11 percent. Finally, we expect to return to a more normalized net insurance margin in financial year 2021. Now, I'd like to set out our financial guidance which includes the acquisition of Littlebird. 
the acquisition did not materially alter our growth expectation for 2020 revenue or of EBITDA. For the third quarter of 2020, we expect gap revenue to be down approximately 3%. We expect net service revenue to be down in the range of down 22% to down 17% year over year. And as I mentioned previously, our third quarter net service revenue guidance is impacted by the timing of our recovery accrual and our expected COVID-19 insurance costs. As a result, we expect our net insurance margin to be in the range of 6 to 8%. We are forecasting an adjusted EBITDA margin in the range of 12 to 18% for the quarter. Again, our adjusted EBITDA margin in the quarter is impacted by timing related to the recovery credit accrual, expected COVID-19 impacts on insurance costs, and one-time OPEX investments. We expect Q3 GAAP earnings per share to be down year over year in the range of down 102% to down 93%, and adjusted net income per share to be down year over year in the range of down 90% to down 75%. Turning to our full year 2020 guidance. Because of the outperformance of our volume in the second quarter, the change shape of our second half volume forecast, the realized mix shift to our white collar verticals, and the cumulative first half financial performance, we're taking the top end of our guidance higher. For gap revenue, we now expect the year over year change to be in the range of flat to up 1% up from our previous guidance of down 8% to down 3% year over year. We now forecast our net service revenue to be flat to up 5% year over year versus our previous guidance of flat to up 4% year over year. Our full year 2020 adjusted EBITDA margin is now expected to be approximately 38 to 41%, up two points at the top end. Gap earnings per share are now expected to be down 8% to a growing 9% year over year, raised from our previous guidance of down 8% to down 1% year over year. Adjusted net income per share is now expected to be down 3% to up 14%, raised from our previous guidance of down 3% to up 4% year over year. With that, I will return the call to Burton for his closing remarks. Burton? I am very proud of the entire Trinet team for the results delivered in the second quarter in the face of COVID-19. The positive results related to revenue, profit, cash flow, client retention, NPS surveys, cost control, and marketing impact reflect a strong outcome as we help our customers navigate these difficult times. I am equally proud of the many resilient customers we serve every single day. They are the innovators and entrepreneurs who represent the backbone of our economy. These are the companies that will lead us through our nation's recovery. With the recovery credit program we've announced today, we will be pleased to stand by them as they survive and thrive. The current Trinet operating model is working well, and we will continue to leverage it in the face of the uncertainty that confronts us. We are passionate about helping our customers navigate and implement new constructs like PPP loan forgiveness as they become available. Regardless, if this is the new normal or a short-lived blip in our country's history, Trinet is well positioned to provide the resources necessary to help our customers pursue their business goals and secure future success. Operator? We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star than one on your touchstone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the key. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. And at this time, there will be a brief pause until the first question.
And our first question today will come from Tim Jin Wong with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for all the, the detail as well. I know there's a a lot of moving pieces. Maybe, maybe I'll ask on um hey Burton, maybe I'll ask on retention. Um, because I understand that sales is a little bit more difficult. Um but retention sort of stood out to me here with you know, with the higher MPS scores. You you talked about higher 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 utilization helping, automation helping. So where is it now? Has your thinking on how high it can go changed given what you've learned through this initial COVID period? Sure. Hi, Tinjin. This is Mike. The way I hey, think Mike. about it is there's really two pieces that affect our WRC volume. The first is attrition, which is client attrition. And what we've seen is that our pattern of attrition this year compared to this time last year is about the same for the half year. And I think the other aspect is our clients laying off their employees, and that's really the driver of the force and the performance in the second quarter. Got you, got you. And then if I if I heard you correctly, for the quarter, you, you talked about net service revenue was roughly flat if we excluded the recovery credit as well as the, the, the COVID impact here. Is that here your your messaging on how we should consider the the baseline assumption here for for the second quarter what a clean baseline would be is that the um intent yes we yes that that's right understood and then lastly maybe for you burton just on the the acquisition here i, I think you mentioned it was relatively small in terms of, of impact. Anything else you can share in terms of size or a number of WSEs, the risk model? What else do they bring that you lacked? Yeah, so look, Tinjin, this is uh, really exciting for me. Our vertical-oriented business model is working very well in this economy, and it's allowed us to focus on exactly what these verticals need and what these industries are asking for. The Little Bird acquisition represents exactly that. You know I'm passionate about the nonprofit space, the education space as well. And they have expertise that's gonna come on to Trinet and help us get even better in this particular space. They're based out of New York, a stronghold for Trinet, and I'm excited that they're on board the size is very, very small, but the impact I can have over time with them helping us in this particular vertical is exciting. And as to yeah. the financials, overall, Tinjin, it's immaterial to our financials, but to give you some color, it's about 1% of our volume, and we believe it will be accretive over time. Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that you can amplify the growth rate. Thank you for all the details. Hey, thank you, Tenjin. We appreciate you. Hey, once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then one. And our next question will come from Andrew Nicholas with William Blair. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, the first one I wanted to ask about, I think, <clears throat> Burton, in your prepared remarks, you made a comment about the average deal size um, has nearly doubled year over year. Um, I was just hoping you could parse that out a little bit further. What's driving that change, and, and what does that mean for, for your addressable market more broadly, sales cycles, growth outlook, that sort of thing? So the, the solution that we're delivering is landing very well with our customer base. And we believe by going up market, which was a conscious decision on the part of Trinet, allows us to expand that value proposition for those particular customers. So what you will see over time is that we will expand on the size of the customers that come to Trinet, and they will avail themselves of the medical, the technology, and the risk transfer that our unique model offers. So we're focused on the customers that really understand the direct value proposition, and we find that as the customers grow, that value proposition grows with the customers. 
Got it. Got it. Makes sense. And then um, just on the balance sheet, um, I think you have nearly $650 million in cash uh, at quarter end. And, and obviously what, what seems to be a little bit more stable of a backdrop, or at least less uncertain than it was last quarter when you drew down on your credit facility. I was just hoping you could speak to near and medium term capital allocation priorities, um, where repurchases fit alongside M&A Outlook. Thank you. Sure. So this is, uh, thank you. Uh, so as I said in my prepared remarks, our plan is unchanged as it regards to capital allocation and our plan is to buy in the second half of the year roughly the same amount as we purchased in the first half of the year subject to the stock price. I think with regards to M&A, our view is that nothing has changed. We're always in the market for the right kind of transaction. And as we look at multiples and the fit, we'll examine those opportunities. Great, thank you. Thank you. And our next question will come from Kevin McVeigh with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Hey, um, Horton, you talked about a 70% um, participation rate on the healthcare side. Can you help us frame that a little bit in terms of where it's been historically, where do you think it can go to, and just, I guess, any thoughts around that if we could start there? So, Burton, let me take that one for you. Oh, okay. So we, Thank you. we have historically uh, had about um, mid-60s kind of performance previously, and so it represents about a 4 or 5% mix shift to the favorable for us right now. And, and what and you'll see is a pattern. What you'll see is a pattern of white-collar participants being much more enrolled, whereas our blue-collar is much generally much lower enrollment. And Kevin, I'll add to that that the 80% white collar mix in our book is a direct, you know, that it's 70% is a direct outcome of the mix shift. But what's good about that is that we are finding that customers who take our medical insurance generally stay longer with Trinet. And that's part of the comment I was trying to make about selling the whole value proposition and finding the verticals, the industries, and the right customer size where the entire value proposition um, resonates best. No, that makes sense. And then is there any way to think about um, within that 70%, how much take, takes workers' comp as well? So generally, Kevin, all of our customers uh, offer workers' compensation and take it. Got it. That's helpful. And then any sense of just, Mike, um, how we're thinking about WSC over, over the this third and fourth quarter? Just remind us of that if you could. So, sure. We don't actually give out volume for um, the, the in our guide. Um, our gap revenue for the full year is about 0 to 5%, and that's a reasonable proxy net of rate and mix for our volume guide. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And our next question comes from David Grisman with Steeple Financial. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. You know, it, it, there's just so many, you know, moving pieces in this environment for you guys. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe just kind of help us think at a high level about just the impact of retention, um, which sounds like, if I heard you right, is roughly flat year over year. Maybe I got that wrong, but it sounded like it was flat. We we have some deferred de decision making on the new bookings, and WSCs is probably anybody's <clears throat> guess, but definitely trending better than we thought. So, you know, as we, and I know you don't want to comment beyond this year, but can you give us any kind of high level way to think about how each of these different, you know, factors may impact? next year, excluding, of course, the net insurance margin, which I think we all, you know, understand will be going down year over year next year. So we don't really give out our guide for 2021. I would tell you that the way we think about exiting the year is that the recovery from where we are now is going to be flatter and longer. We see that 
Um, new sales will continue at lower levels through the second quarter and through the remainder of the year. And our gap guide is a reasonable proxy for volume, net of rate, and mix. Got it. And did I hear you right, though, that attrition was flat year over year as of the end of June? So for the six months this year versus six months last year, it was broadly similar. Got it. Okay. And as we think about... Uh, David, David uh, yeah. what I would say about that is I'm particularly pleased with the retention rates. I'm particularly pleased, as you think about it, with the NPS scores. We have seen a direct correlation between customer satisfaction, referrals, and new business, which I believe will pay off over time. I think that the recovery credit program is particularly exciting as it relates to 2021. And the team is just performing very well in this COVID environment. I believe that it distinguishes us from a cobbled together set of solutions having a single provider that can provide the technology, the service, and the risk reduction is showing well in this economy. Right, so thanks for that, Burton. So let, let's just take that a step further and, and think about you know the professional services revenue, which I, I think declines less than WSCs, probably because of the mix shift you know, to white collar. But as you think about your pipeline, and you gave some good detail about that previously, should we expect that professional services revenue to start, you know, kind of distancing itself or seeing more significant increases relative to the WFC count just based on what's in your sales pipeline? So what I would say is that we see that our rate and mix continues the rest of the year on professional service revenues at the same rate and pace, and that the gap guide really gives you the, the, the insight into how to think about volume for the rest of the year. Right, but I think I was talking about mix within the volume, so, you know, white versus blue. And so so I, think, I think the way we're thinking about it right now is we may see some, in our down scenario, we may see some more increase in mix, but in our up scenario, our mix would stay broadly stable. Got it. And then just one last thing, just on the sure. workers' comp side, you know, is there any, uh, you know, kind of significant adjustments year over year or sequentially to the workers' comp accrual that we should think about or through the balance of the year that you've reflected in guidance? So in our results, we posted favorable development of about five to six million dollars, and we haven't seen any particular significant and material impact from COVID right yet. Workers' compensation developed slowly. We we don't see anything changing right now. So you don't see any material risk based on what you're seeing right now of people coming back and and claiming workers comp, you know, COVID worker comp or COVID related workers comp claims. It's too early to tell. Uh, I think that there are various legislative pressures in different locations that could swing it one way or the other. And uh, it remains uncertainty, and that's to a certain extent why we've widened the range of our potential, of our guidance for the year to capture more potential outcomes. Got it. All right, guys, uh, congratulations. Good luck. Uh, thank you so much. And, and I am incredibly humbled by this customer base and their resilience and their focus, David. So hopefully that will continue. And our next question will come from Sam England with Berenberg. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, just a couple for me. Just around the new business pipeline, can you give us an idea of what you've seen in terms of postponements or cancellations in Q2? And can we expect there's been any work that maybe got postponed due to everything that was going on in Q2 that will kick in in Q3 and, and Q4? So I have seen deferred decision-making what I would say is, in its simplest form, what I'm seeing is that prospects, frankly, are most concerned about the front of the shop right now. They're concerned about staying in business. So while we can help with that, it's difficult for them to make a decision to change the back end in the current environment. So 
we're staying focused on servicing our customers and know there's a direct correlation between this customer satisfaction, referrals, and the new business, which should pay off over time. Additionally, the marketing efforts are paying off as well. Okay, great, thanks. And then I suppose looking ahead to the rest of the, going ahead to the rest of this year, how are you thinking about the ramp up times for new clients given what's going on with remote working? Is it taking longer to deploy with your clients now or can you do things as quickly as you could before? That's an awesome question. The team is doing the onboarding remotely and they're doing a very good job. We measure the NPS results immediately after implementation, which as you know is quite complex in moving uh, a client over to Trinet. And I am really thrilled with the type of scores we're getting and the team's adaptability to the onboarding of these new clients. A lot of this is gonna depend on how the curve ultimately forms but I believe that uh, the team is doing a good job on the implementation remotely. Great, thanks. And, then, and then maybe just thanks. one more, and sorry if I, sure. I didn't catch it. You mentioned, you mentioned some increased OPEX investment in the back half of this year. What, what's that related to? Uh, what's that investment going into? So as we said on the last quarter, we were gonna be prudent with expenses through the rest of the year. And uh, as a result, we have definitely been careful with our colleague-related expenses. We, we have pivoted and remain focused on some long-term investments, and Burton discussed process improvement and platform modularity issues. Clearly, we got the financial levers to pull if we have any changes to the outcome. But for now, we think it makes sense to continue to focus on the long term. And, and just to add to what Mike just said is we're planning to invest further in 2020, particularly in process improvements and automation. We believe that the Q2 performance indicates that these investments are paying off as evidenced by our ability to work remotely, which I have 3,000 people doing, and servicing our customers how they want to be serviced. We're continuing these investments in the third quarter and in the second half. Uh, but to be clear, the spend that Mike's talking about are project-based investments, not a ramp up in people. Okay, great. Thanks very much, guys. Hey, and ladies and gentlemen, this will conclude our question and answer session, also concluding today's conference. We'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation, and at this time, you may now disconnect your lines, and have a great day.